computer and how does it work? To compare a classical computer to a quantum computer, we first need to look at the smallest unit of information. While a conventional computer uses a bit that is either on or off in zero or one state, the quantum computer, on the other hand, uses qubits. A qubit can be in both zero and one state at the same time. Those states are called superpositions, which gives, gives us the possibility to store much more information in one single qubit. To use a qubit to do quantum computation, we need to connect them. We do that by entanglement, which Albert Einstein himself called spooky action at a distance. And it really is kind of spooky because the states of both qubits are interconnected in a way that the states of each, of each qubit depends on the other. So if you measure one, that will impact the state of the other qubit. And the way we use that for quantum computation is that we create a large cluster of entangled qubit, qubits that form a network which we can use to perform logical operations. And this is very powerful, as you can see here. This is a, a plot demonstrated showing two algorithms for prime factorization. One is Shor's algorithm, and the other one is the best classical algorithm. If you look at the time it takes a computer to factorize a number with 2,000 digits, you really see the power of the quantum computer. The quantum computer can factorize a 2,000 digit number in one year, while a classical computer takes the age of the universe for the same task. So that's about 14 billion times slower. And the importance of this problem in particular is that all our modern encryption algorithms are based on the fact that a classical computer will take a very, very, very long time to, to factorize a large number. However, it's not yet clear how exactly we want to build a quantum computer, and in particular, how we want to construct a qubit. The Nitrogen Vacancy Center is a very promising candidate because of its good qualities, such as being operable at higher temperatures than superconducting qubits, which is what Google is looking at. So the Nitrogen Vacancy Center is a defect in the structure of the diamond, where two uh, carbon atoms that are next to each other are replaced by one nitrogen atom and a vacancy. And in the vacancy, you find a pair of electrons. And what you can do is you can look at the spin state, which is a fundamental quantum property of such a quantum system, and you can create a superposition of the two possible spin states and in that way store information in the vacancy. The way that is read out and entangled afterwards is by shooting a laser at the vacancy and looking at the photon that is returned. However, it's not as easy as it sounds. We have two major issues with entangling the NV centers. On the one hand, the photon that is emitted needs to have one exact frequency because we can only use one wavelength of the photon to do quantum entanglement. On the other hand, we need a high collection efficiency because what use is a photon with the right wavelength if you just lose it into free space instead of collecting it? So let's start with fixing the first issue. We can actually force the emission into the right wavelength. Oh, uh, so if the, the, the emission at the right wavelength is a particular issue for the NV center, because if you look at the emission spectrum, which plots wavelength against intensity, meaning the number of photons emitted, you see that a lot of the emission goes into the sideband instead of the desired wavelength, which we need for quantum computation. But we can fix that issue uh, by using an optical cavity. In its simplest form, an optical cavity consists of two mirrors that are opposing each other with an emitter in the center, in, in our case, the qubit. The qubit will be emitting wave, uh, waves, light waves of different frequencies and wavelengths, in this case, red and orange. And the cavity, due to its properties, will only support one, mo one wavelength namely red in this case, that will be bouncing back and forth in between the mirrors. The orange light will not be able to exist within the cavity and will not be emitted by the uh, qubit at all. In reality, the cavity looks a bit different. 
So we have this nano beam carved into the diamond, and the qubit sits right there in the middle of the beam. The beam is a nano beam, which means that it's at nanometer scale, and it has these holes uh, on both sides of the qubit. And the holes is really what acts as a mirror for our emission and lets the light bounce back and forth and forces emission into the right wavelength. So in this way, we can fix the first issue that we were uh, talking about before. Now we need to look at getting, uh, increasing the collection efficiency. Right now, if we look at the emission of our cavity, it looks somewhat like this. You shoot the laser at the cavity and the light is just emitted in all directions. However, what we want looks something more like this. You get, shoot the laser at the cavity and you get emission into one direction in particular so that you can just put in a collection device above the cavity and collect whatever is coming out. For our cavity that I showed you before, this is what the emission profile looks like. So you can see the emission goes in all directions at the same time. You even have two centers of max intensity, which is pretty much useless if you just want to put a collection device at some, point, uh, at some location above the cavity because you can't collect both centers of intensity at once. Therefore, what we decided to do is we uh, decided to modify the shape of our cavity by adding these little bumps or perturbations that modify the geometry of the cavity. What they do is they scatter light out of the cavity into one particular direction. You can imagine that if we go back to the image of the mirror cavity, like poking a hole in one of the mirrors, uh, which will let light leak through the hole into one direction in particular. So this design really works. We get an improvement of 12% over an, a bare cavity if we measure the, direction, the emission in one direction. However, we weren't satisfied with that result, and we, want, and we also saw that the bumps had somewhat a focusing effect on the emission. So we decided to exploit that in our next design. This is what we came up with. So the bumps are increasing in size as you move further outwards. And this is because you want scatterers that all emit light at the same strength. If we observe the, the behavior of the scatterers as sources, we see that they, they act like point sources of the wave that is emitted and create co constructive interference right above the cavity. So if we go back to the emission profile that I showed you earlier and add that circle for some emission uh, collection device, uh, you can see that really not much of the emission is collected at all. However, if we compare this emission profile to the profile of our optimized cavity, things look quite different. Here you see that a lot of the light that is emitted goes through the area of collection, and thereby we can collect a lot of the emitted photons. We can quantify this result by looking at the enhancement of collection, which is defined as the integral of the emission through the collection surface, of the optimized cavity by the divided by the same measure of the unoptimized cavity. And you see, especially for the, the area that I marked before, which I indicated with the dashed line here, you get an improvement by factor 15. If you take some collection device with an evil, even lower angle of acceptance, you will get an even greater improvement. For, let's say, a multi-mode fiber as a collection device, you will get an improvement of up to factor 50, which is far higher than what we observe in current literature, at least for the same quality of cavity. In this way, we have now fixed both problems for entanglement. We have emission at the right wavelength due to the cavity, and we also have high collection efficiency due to the perturbations that we added. So in conclusion, We've designed two, uh, two proposed designs to increase collection efficiency, and one device in particular increases collection efficiency by over an order of magnitude for several measurement devices. In future research, we would like to look at an experimental proof of our designs that are actually effective also in practice, and also look at asymmetrical designs as though they uh, might actually increase collection efficiency above 50% in total. I would like to thank these people for their support, in, uh, in particular Professor Dirk England, Sarah Meradian, and Noel Wan 
who have mentored me during my project. And of course, RSI, the Center of Excellence in Education and MIT for making this possible. Thank you so much for listening. So, one of the key things that you want to be able to do is ultimately produce a million entangled qubits in a system to use on computation to factor in noise and the other issues. So some of the structures you proposed are, are, are not isotropic. So if you were to put multiple MV centers together, how would you envision doing that in a way where each one needs to be the center of its own universe? So the question was basically, how will we scale up a system of multiple NV qubits? So um, at the moment, research is mainly focusing on entangling NV centers at all. Until now, we are only able to entangle two NV centers at the same time. However, NV centers, or in general, solid state qubits, promise to be very scalable due to their smaller size compared to trapped ions, for example. And um, I would imagine this uh, to work differently that, than what I proposed, because in, in a quantum computer at the end, you would not want emission into the direction that we were looking at right now, but rather along the direction of the cavity. Basically, you would just leave some holes away, thereby decrease the reflectance of one side of the cavity and just let the light pass through that side and read it out in that way. Actually, I have like three questions. <laughs> so the first question is, uh, so you're obviously doing simulations of some kind to predict the optical density pattern nerves, and what were you using, what were the tools? So um, the question was what, sim what simulation tool I used. Uh, I used Lumerical um, and did FDDT simulations, which is uh, finite difference time domain simulations, uh, which is a common tool in, in the field, especially of uh, qu cavity quantum electrodynamics. Is uh, you present very well the, the geometry of your of your nano array, um, but the, the, where was your uh, illumination from, and where were you detecting from? Uh, there, like there wasn't any reference for that. Yeah. So let me just go back to this design. So um, if you would build a cavity like this, your NV center would sit right there in the center, and you would um, illuminate or try to read out the cavity with a laser pointing into minus z direction. And then you would try to get the emission to go back the same way, so into positive z direction, so that you can use uh, the same optical setup to read out the qubit as well. Why the choice of circles for your, your cavity? Uh, I mean, it seems like the, the reflective surfaces on that create an unstable resin in your cavity as opposed to a stable resin. So why would you use that? So the holes in the cavity itself? Okay, so the question was, why do we use holes and not any other shape? So uh, one reason is that it, holes are very easy to manufacture. So on this scale, <coughs> manufacturing anything at all is basically a miracle already. We, uh, things are so small. Um, second of all, since we're talking about such a small scale, the light that is uh, propagating through the cavity will actually have a wavelength uh, so that the shape of the holes does matter way less because the light will not really notice the shape of the holes. It would rather notice a change in refract refractive index more than what kind of shape it has, it is in the cavity. Two questions, both are stupid. So <laughs> the first one is pretty high level. Uh, what part is the need, uh, no, uh, what by part of that uh, is, uh, is normal? Is novel? Okay, okay. the question was, uh, what part of our work is novel? So the way that the cavity here is designed is pretty novel because what it has been done or tried before at least is, well, the, the whole cavity, um, like using cavities to force emission into the right wavelength is not a novel approach. However, this cavity as it, it is proposed here is 
just a recent development. And also, the way that we add the perturbations is, uh, hasn't been done before in that, in that sense. For the, perturbations. They have perturbations, but they look very different, which in turn decreases the quality of the cavity. Uh, that is why if we compare our results to p results that have previously been published on one-dimensional photonic crystal cavities that have the same effect, or um, for the quality of the cavity, we achieve three times higher results than what has been previously done. Yeah. Thank you. Very the second question is probably coming from my deep misunderstanding. You want to have in the actual computer multiple things like that. And the bars are not permeable for the light. How do you start it together to have many of them? Do you need to start together many of them? And if you do, how does light travel between them? OK, so uh, the question is, uh, again, about scalability. How would we build a quantum computer using those? Uh, yeah. Exactly. Um, so first of all, to outperform a classical computer, really, we really don't need thousands of qubits. A very few qubits are enough to, to outperform classical computers in certain tasks because of the exp exponential growth in, in uh, computation power. Um, so as I mentioned before, it, we would not use the exact same design that is proposed right here for, to build an actual quantum computer. This is more thought as an experimental design to study the, well, the properties of both the NV center and the cavity. In a real computer, you would probably modify the shape in a different way. For example, decrease the re reflection on one side of the cavity so that the light would not come out in this direction, but rather travel through the diamond in this direction and, and leave the cavity in that way. Any other questions from the judges? Uh, questions from the audience? All right, thank you.